Welcome to the second part of ENB448 and ENN580. My name is Peter Cork. In this second part, we're going to talk about digital control. So far in control, you've learned about analog control. You've learned about Laplace transforms. You've learned about how to build compensators out of resistors and capacitors and op amps. In this first lecture, what I want to do is try and provide an introduction and a motivation for why you might want to do this instead using a digital computer. So in order to just put a bit of context around this, I thought it's useful to go back and just look at the history of control theory itself, just so we can understand where we stand today. So here's a simple timeline about control. And in the literature, it's divided up into four eras, the prehistory, the primitive era, the classical era, and the modern era. So a lot of the control that you've learned so far in your careers comes from the classical era. And what you've learned in the first part of this unit about state space control comes from the so-called modern era. So let's step back into prehistory and see what was going on there. So a really good example of a control system from prehistory is the float regulator. You've got one of these in your toilet. Uh, it's not particularly clever but it's very, very functional. And it's simply a float on a lever connected to a valve. And what it does, it's a control system, it's a regulator, it ensures that the water level in your system rises up to a predetermined level and then stops. So very functional, very simple, and there must be billions of them on the planet today. Perhaps a rather more technologically interesting uh, or more challenging uh, device was the centrifugal governor, which was invented by James Watt. Interestingly, this thing was invented in the same year as our country was settled. And what it was used for was to control the speed of steam engines. So if the steam engine was going too quickly, uh, the two balls, the two weights that are labeled B in the middle diagram there, uh, are thrown outwards by centrifugal force and the lever mechanism that's associated with those then reduces the amount of steam going into the steam engine and reduces its speed. So if you set everything up very nicely, then this centrifugal governor can ensure that a steam engine runs at a constant speed. So a really uh, important invention for steam engines and that led to the whole industrial revolution in society as we know it today. Uh, very, very important invention. In 1868 uh, is really the end of the era called prehistory because this guy, James Clerk Maxwell, wrote down the mathematics that defined control theory. He was the first person to do this. So before that, it was all a little bit ad hoc with float regulators and centrifugal governors. Uh, James Clerk Maxwell, you probably also know, perhaps from electromagnetics, he wrote the, uh, the famous Maxwell's equations that you've probably encountered in other units. So Maxwell was the end of prehistory in the beginning of the primitive era. And I have to confess, I don't actually know much about the primitive era. The next era that's very interesting to me is the classical era. And uh, here are four gentlemen who contributed a lot to classical control theory. Uh, the oldest of these is Harry Nyquist. And you perhaps know him from something called the Nyquist plot. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a graphical technique that's used for control system design. Uh, Hendrik Bode uh, is probably well known to you uh, from the Bode plot. Sometimes it's pronounced Bode plot. And Evans invented something called the root locus diagram, which I do believe that you are familiar with. Harold Black, uh, the second guy from the left, is pretty famous because in 1927 he invented the concept of negative feedback for electronic circuits. And negative feedback is one of those really important underlying principles in control theory that uh, you look at the difference between uh, the output of your plant and what you want. You take the difference, that's why it's called negative feedback, and then you feed that into the system. You have a closed loop and uh, if you're lucky, or if you've designed it well, uh, then it can be stable. Uh, there's, there's interesting myths and legends around Harold Black. Uh, he said that the idea of negative feedback came to him when he was on the ferry going to work uh, one day in 1927. 
So he bought a copy of the New York Times and wrote down his ideas on that. And that's what you can see. The middle image there is a copy from the archives of Harold Black's scribblings on a copy of the New York Times. All of these guys work for Bell Labs. Uh, it was an awesome research organization uh, in the early part of last century. Uh, it invented the transistor, invented the laser, invented radio astronomy, as well as uh, negative feedback. Uh, at the time, it was probably the equivalent of Google. You know, it was a massive telecommunications company, but it had a very, very impressive research arm, just as Google does today. So in you know, the early part of the 1900s, it was the place to be for researchers, engineers, and inventors. If we move then into what's called the modern era, generally considered to start in 1960, uh, it was made possible by the invention of the digital computer in the late 1940s. It was a technology that uh, was developed at, during World War II, became available really just after World War II, but it was really driven by the space program, which uh, kick, kicked off or kicked into high gear in the early 1960s. And it's the idea of you know, using computers uh, in a control system that really defines the modern control era. And that's what we're talking about in this particular unit and certainly in uh, the second half of this unit. So state space methods that uh, you've been introduced to uh, in the previous lectures are uh, really all considered as part of modern control theory. So the modern era starts in 1960 and is still going. So to me, a really seminal achievement of modern control is the Apollo Lunar Land Computer shown here. So this is a relatively small device, very, very primitive computer, but a computer nonetheless. And you know, it is able to land people on the moon uh, uh, numerous times. So I think a, a very impressive example of early computer control technology. Okay, let's review the control design process. Now you should be well familiar with this from uh, the first part of this unit and from previous units. And to my mind, there are really five important steps in designing a control system. Now, the first is to obtain what we call a model of the plant that we're going to control. And typically this is expressed as a transfer function, uh, a Laplace transform, and it's expressed in terms of the variable S. And the next step, the step two, is we need to decide on some performance criteria that our controller must meet. So we've got a plant that we want to control. We want to decide how well we want to control it. How quickly is it going to settle on the output value that we demand? What's going to be the overshoot and so on. And so I'm hoping that you're familiar also with these techniques. The next step then is to design a compensator. And there are lots of methods to design compensators, that uh, some of which you will be familiar with. There are others in textbooks that you perhaps haven't met yet. So root locus diagram is one. Bode plot is, a, is one. And as I say, there are, there are many others. So the compensator is designed based on the model of the plant and on the performance criteria. The next step then is to implement the compensator. And you might implement that in terms of resistors and capacitors. Uh, there may be an op amp in there. You then you connect your compensator to your plant and you do some tests on it. Perhaps you measure the step response time. You know, is the overshoot what you, what you expected? Is the settling time what you expected? Um, if it is, then it's all good. Your job's over and uh, you can go on to the next project. If it isn't, it means that something's not quite right. So it might be that the model of the plant isn't what you expected it to be. Uh, it may be that you've made some error in designing your compensator. Whatever, if there's not a good match, then what you've basically got to do is go back to step two and repeat the process until you get a compensator that works nicely. So in the previous lectures, you've looked at implementing compensators using networks of resistors and capacitors. And these are some slides that I borrowed from, from Dave that show different types of compensators, lag compensators, lead compensators, lead lag compensators. If you had an op amp in here, then uh, you've got a, a great richness of choices. Uh, you can implement uh, PI controllers, PD controllers, PID controllers, and, and so on. And 
basically you choose the performance characteristics you want, you design the resistor and capacitor values, implement it, and away you go. So here, for example, we have a, a compensator, uh, S plus 4 over S plus 20.09. And that's how you would implement it in terms of resistors and capacitors. And the control design problem here is, given the transfer function, capital GC, you compensate a transfer function, how do I choose R1, R2, and C? But another way of looking at this network or the transfer function is to say, well, it's simply a function. It's a mathematical function. So instead of implementing it with resistors and capacitors, couldn't we just compute it? So if we know the value of what's going in, we know the model of it, then we can compute what's coming out. So instead of the resistors and the capacitors, we just compute it. So to reiterate the point, instead of building it with resistors and capacitors, why don't we simply program it on a microcontroller? You might say, well, okay, a microcontroller looks pretty complicated. You know, it's probably expensive. It's a big chip. Resistors and capacitors are going to be pretty cheap. Why would I want to program it on a microcontroller? Why is that better? And that's a good question. So what I'd like you to do now is to spend a few minutes discussing uh, what you think the advantage advantages are of doing it digitally. And if you do do it digitally, then in a typical plant, your signals U might be an analog signal coming out of the plant and Y might be an analog signal that goes into the plant. So if they're analog signals and I want to compute this function in a computer, then how am I going to bridge this gap between analog signals and the digital world? So what I'd like you to do is to spend a few minutes having a discussion about this and then uh, we'll move on to the next steps. Okay, so you've had a few moments, I hope, to have uh, a good and useful discussion around these topics. So here are some, some points that uh, occur to me when I think about what are the advantages of doing it digitally. It's actually a lot cheaper than you might think. An 8-bit microprocessor costs around 20 cents if you buy them in quantity. And by quantity, I'm talking tens of thousands of devices. Another really important aspect is that software actually costs nothing to manufacture. You simply copy it. Uh, it costs, certainly costs a lot to develop. It costs a lot to write software and debug it and get it to be perfect. But it doesn't actually cost anything to manufacture. The other thing that's really sweet about software is that you can change it after manufacture. You can reflash the microprocessor. You can load new firmware into it. Or you can simply update some parameters of the controller which are stored within the firmware. So there's some important advantages of using a digital approach to control. Another advantage is that you can easily add extra functionality. Consider that you might want to add a display to your control system so you can understand what it's doing. Right? For an analog system, uh, you might just be limited to putting a meter on it, you know, an old-fashioned meter with a needle. If you've already got a microcontroller there, a digital system, then you can interface it to a little screen and you could display all manner of information. You could display graphs and time histories and whatever. You could even build a simple user interface into this. You could use a touch screen or you could use push buttons. You could have mode selectors so that the controller can operate in different modes. Maybe you can change the parameters of the controller using this user interface. So you can add a whole lot of extra functionality once you've got a microcontroller, a computer embedded into the heart of your control system. Another aspect is communications. Uh, it might be that the controller is, contro is controlling some, perhaps some valve or motor somewhere in a large industrial plant, but you might want to know at a central monitoring station what each individual controller is doing. If it's a microcontroller, then you can easily add a communications link. It could be over a wire, it could be wireless, as the example is shown here with an XB uh, radio module. And then you can radio information from the controller back to the central station so you can see what's going on. Similarly, you could send out commands to the remote controller to uh, change its parameters, 
its operating mode, maybe even to reflash it uh, to run a different program. Another advantage of going digital. Another reason why you might want to go digital is that many sensors today have digital non-analog outputs. So if your sensor's got a digital output, then uh, it's really going to be a whole lot easier if your controller is digital also. So here's an example of a very common sensor used in uh, motor controllers called an incremental encoder. Uh, basically, it's a small disk with, uh, with a printed pattern of, of slots on it. And as it rotates, it uh, outputs two signals. Here they're called A and B. And if it rotates in one direction, then A and B have got a particular phase relationship. If it's moving in the opposite direction, you can see a different phase relation. Either B leads A, if we're going one direction, or A leads B. So by looking at the, uh, the sequence of edges of these two signals, A and B, we can determine which direction the motor's moving in. And from the frequency of the edges, we can determine how fast it's moving. So these sensors are really very, very cheap and are generally attached to a lot of small motors. Often you can buy them as an integrated assembly, a motor and an encoder. And the encoder provides the critical information to the control system. How fast is this motor shaft turning and in what direction is it turning? So here's a sensor with digital, not analog outputs. Now, some systems are also controlled by a digital input, uh, not, by an, not by an analog input. So here's again another example from motor control. We have a motor in what's called an H-bridge configuration, and there are four FETs, which are shown as uh, colored circles there. And by switching the FETs in the appropriate way, we can apply voltage to the motor in either one direction or the opposite direction, so we can control its speed. And controlling the duty cycle of the pulses on the gates of the FETs, we can control the average voltage applied to the motor, and hence its speed. So the important thing we need to do here is to generate a waveform and control the duty cycle. That is the ratio of the on time to the off time. And over on the bottom right, you can see some examples of a small duty cycle, a medium duty cycle, and a full duty cycle. Now, generally these uh, pulses are occurring at a very, very high frequency, perhaps tens of kilohertz. The motor can't respond to that high frequency, but it responds to the average value of this pulse stream. So the 10% duty cycle, it sees that as a relatively low voltage, 50% it sees as a medium voltage, 90% it sees on average as a high voltage and will therefore rotate faster. So uh, we can connect a digital computer to a motor uh, using just uh, some digital outputs to create these pulse width modulation sequences. We can connect uh, an incremental encoder to the motor shaft, and from that we can work out how fast the motor is spinning and in which direction. And that's really all we need to do to build a digital motor controller. So, many advantages of going digital. Now, the microcontroller that I mentioned earlier, one that cost 20 cents, uh, if you buy enough of them. Uh, here's an example of, of one of these. There are many, many microcontrollers on the market. Uh, this is one that I have some familiarity with. It's made by a company called Atmel. The process is called an Atmega 128. And over on the right-hand side here, we have a block diagram of this microcontroller. And you can see that it's got an awful lot of functional units in there. So let's just highlight some of them. Uh, at the core of this thing is a computer. Uh, so it's got program flash memory. The Atmega has perhaps 64 kilobytes of flash memory. That's where you hold the program that implements the controller. It's got RAM, and this is where the program holds all its variables, and that's typically four or eight kilobytes. Relatively small compared to the sorts of computers you have in your laptop or a desktop computer, but more than enough to do this kind of control work. So two types of memory, program flash, which holds the program code up to 64 kilobytes, SRAM, which holds your program variables, maybe only four or eight kilobytes. This microcontroller also has some E squared PROM. That's generally quite small, maybe only 256 bytes, but it's non-volatile memory and it can hold uh, configuration parameters and so on. So even if the chip's completely depowered, uh, what's in the E PROM and what's in the program flash uh, is not erased. So that's the core of the computer. 
all of these other blocks are input and output functions. So all around the, the top and the bottom are a whole lot of digital I.O. pins. Uh, so these uh, can be controlled by the, the program software and they can be you know, raised up or, or down. Uh, they can also be connected uh, through all sorts of logic to internal units. So you can connect a particular digital I.O. pin, you can connect it to an internal pulse width modulation generator, you can connect to a counter or something like that. Like lots and lots of digital I.O. capacity. Uh, we also have a couple of USARTs, which means that the chip can communicate over a standard RS-232 type of serial interface. A lot of peripheral devices out there that speak RS-232 serial, and so this chip can talk with those sorts of devices. It's also got an SPI and a TWI interface, and this allows the chip to talk to a lot of other sensor chips. A lot of chips today uh, have got relatively small numbers of pins and you communicate with them over a very simple serial bus. So SPI and TWI are two standards for communicating with these kinds of IO chips. So you might buy analog to digital converters that speak SPI, you might buy a LED driver, you might buy an LCD screen driver that, that speak uh, these protocols. Up the top uh, middle, we have an A to D converter. On the Atmega, I think it has 10 analog to digital channels. So we can directly read analog signals, convert them into digital values, and uh, use those inside the control algorithm that you might implement. This particular chip does not have a D to A converter on board. If you wanted a D to A converter, it would have to be a separate chip connected using either the parallel uh, digital lines or connected via SPI or TWI bus. Okay. So a really big application of microcontrollers, as I mentioned earlier, is motor drives. Uh, motor drives are everywhere. You know, they're in security cameras to pan and tilt the cameras to look at uh, interesting parts of the scene. They're in automatic teller machines. They're in printers. They're in computer hard drives. They're inside vending machines. They're inside cars to do things like wind windows up and down and control air conditioning vents and they're also in manufacturing equipment. They're in robots, they're in automated guided vehicles, they're in uh, CNC machines. Uh, motor drives, digital motor drives are everywhere in the world. I don't know how many of them there are on the planet, but there'd have to be billions and billions of them. It's a really big market. Now, not all computers cost 20 cents, and I really need to stress this point, and it's a point that we will come back to uh, later in this lecture series. So the little Atmega, that I talked about earlier. If you buy them in sufficient quantity, it can cost 20 cents. The sort of computer that you have in your laptop or your desktop computer, uh, here's a, a sort of top end Intel a Core i7 processor, you know, they cost many hundreds of dollars. And uh, so what I'd like you to do is to think a bit about why does the Intel processor cost a whole lot more? Uh, what is it that makes it cost $300 instead of 20 cents? So I'd like to have a bit of a discussion about that and I'll rejoin you in a couple of moments. Okay, here's my list of why I think the Intel processor costs a whole lot more. Certainly it's much, much faster than the Atmega processor. Uh, in fact, you know, a processor of this class is really eight separate computers uh, in the one package. You know, it has uh, four cores, each of those is hyper-threaded, so you can consider it as effectively eight processors that can all operate in parallel. It can perform floating point arithmetic. This is double precision arithmetic rather than integer arithmetic, which the uh, Atmega processor can do. Uh, the Intel processor can address a huge amount of memory, gig, many, many gigabytes of memory, whereas the Atmega processor can address, you know, taps tens of kilobytes of memory. The Intel processor can also access memory or operate on chunks of data that are much, much larger. The Atmega processor can deal with 8-bit and 16-bit quantities. The Intel processor can deal with quantities up to 128 bits wide. Uh, so it can really crunch through a lot of data. Uh, so that's what you pay the extra money for. And that's certainly the sort of processor that you want to have uh, in a computer that's performing desktop functions. Large amounts of arithmetic, large amounts of graphics rendering. You need all of this computational power. 
But for simple microcontrollers, for motor controllers, you don't need all that extra power. We can get by with very simple computers. Now that means then, if we're going to use a very simple computer, we need to have quite simple programs that run on them so that they can go sufficiently quickly. And it's one of the issues that we're going to talk about in this unit is how do we design the algorithms, the program code that goes into the microcontroller, and how do we ensure that it goes sufficiently fast. We also need to discuss what does it mean sufficiently fast, how fast is enough. And that's also a point that we're going to touch on in lectures and also in prax and tutorials. Okay, so let's go back to the example that we were discussing earlier. Here we have a compensated transfer function. Hopefully you're familiar with how you generate a compensated transfer function, GC. And we know that we can implement it with a network of resistors or capacitors, but we're also speculating that we can implement it on a computer. A computer that computes a function Y as a function of U. So in order to uh, make some progress here, I'm going to introduce the terms capital Y and capital U. Uh, and these are Laplace transforms of the signals U of T and Y of T. This is quite common in control theory that we use lowercase letters like U and Y to represent signals in the time domain. That's why I've written them as functions of T. And we use the corresponding capital letters, Y and U, written as functions of S to represent the Laplace transforms of those two signals. So a compensator, as you know, is a, is a ratio of the output of the compensator to the input of the compensator. It's the ratio of Y to U. So fairly simple step just then. Now let's rearrange this. Uh, let's uh, move capital U over to one side. Let's move the S plus 20.09 to the other side. That's pretty straightforward. Let's expand that out. And now we have this form here. And at this point, we need to really understand what this S thing is. Uh, I know this is a source of a lot of confusion for people who are studying control theory. I wrestled with it myself for a long period of time. So what is S? So what I'd like you to do is have a bit of a discussion uh, about what is S. And then we'll come back and we'll get into some detail about what I think S is and how we use this uh, in designing a computer program to implement the compensator that I just talked about. Okay, what is S? Well, one way to, uh, to, to understand Laplace transforms is to look up tables of Laplace transforms. Now, most control textbooks will have tables of Laplace transforms, oftentimes inside the front cover or inside the Mac cover. This is a table that I lifted from Wikipedia. Uh, and what it shows is that S is uh, a differentiation operator. Uh, what it's saying is that uh, S multiplied by some function in the S domain is the same as the derivative of the function in the time domain. So this is uh, a definition of what S does. It's saying that it takes the derivative in the t it's equivalent to the derivative in the time domain. A few other ways to think about it, and we'll, we'll work through these. Uh, so, just to s summarize that one, S in the in the Laplace domain, which is indicated here by the capital X. So, S times capital X. This is a Laplace transform way of thinking about it. Is equivalent to dx dt, the derivative operator in the time domain. There we go. Let's be a little bit more rigorous, uh, and that means we have to get into mathematics. And this looks a little intimidating, uh, but let's not be intimidated by it. Sure, we're not mathematicians, but as engineers, we do need to understand and be able to use some mathematics. So the definition of the Laplace transform is of the sort of Laplace transform of any function is the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus st times the function that you're trying to compute the Laplace transform of. So in this case, what we're going to do is compute the Laplace transform of f prime. That's the derivative of the function f. And to do that, we need to be able to evaluate this integral over on the right-hand side. And yeah, it's not a very friendly looking integral. So what can we do with that? Well, there's a technique called integration by parts. 
and that's going to be our friend here. So integration by part says that we integrate uh, the product of two functions. Uh, we can express that then in terms of the product of two functions minus the integral uh, of uh, a product of two functions. Now note the, the primes here. The prime indicates the der derivative. And so we, basically we're saying the integral of a function times the derivative of a function is equal to the product of the two functions without any derivatives minus the integral of the derivative of the function which didn't have a derivative and the integral of the second function. Uh, if that makes much sense. Okay, let's let's put this into, into practice. So if we look at the original definition of the Laplace transform, we're going to say the e to the minus st is going to be ux and f prime is going to be v prime of x. Uh, so f prime is equal to v prime, so therefore f equals v, and that's going to help us a lot. So let's move this along. Uh, writing now our Laplace transform, uh, we write it in this form here. Uh, and we can see inside of the square brackets, we have u and, and v. And as I said before, f of t is, is equivalent to v of x. Uh, we've lost the derivative. And to that, then we need to add uh, this integral term on the end. The s in front of the integral comes from taking the derivative of e to the minus st. And in the, the second part of that integral is again the function t without the derivative. Now note that there is now no derivative of f anywhere in this equation on the right hand side. Now, we can uh, expand this further, so the square bracket at the front, uh, we can convert into the difference of two limits and the integral on the end. Uh, we recognize uh, the integral is the Laplace transform of f. Uh, that's, what, that's what that is. So we can uh, add onto the end there s times capital Fs. So the Laplace transform of the derivative of f of t is now written in terms of s multiplied by the Laplace transform of f. Now, one of those limits is going to go away because when t goes to infinity, uh, e to the minus st is going to go to zero. So that goes away and we can write our expression now in this form. So what we see, uh, the essence of all of this, is that the Laplace transform of the derivative of a function is equal to s times the Laplace transform of that function. So we see here that s is a derivative operator. When you apply s to the Laplace transform of a function, it's equivalent to taking the derivative in the time domain. So we've been rigorous here, uh, but we've shown uh, exactly what the Wikipedia table showed us. Multiplying by s is equivalent to taking the derivative. So let's consider derivatives uh, in a discrete sense. So here I've got a function and I'm sampling that function at regular time intervals. And those samples are represented by blue dots. Now I'm gonna highlight two of these blue, these blue dots, uh, the time step six and time step seven. So here it is, I've marked x6 and x7 against those two blue dots. Now I wanna compute what's the derivative here. So the derivative, as you know, is the tangent, it's the slope of the line. So I'm trying to compute the slope of this function between x6 and x7. So I've drawn a line that goes between x6 and x7. And I want to compute the gradient, I want to compute the slope here. And I do that quite simply by looking at the horizontal distance, which is the time step, the time interval between step 6 and step 7, and divide it and I'm going to divide that into the vertical change in the function, which is x7 minus x6. So an approximation for the derivative at this point in time is given by xk uh, for the kth step minus the previous step, x to the k minus 1, divided by delta t, the time interval. So in this particular case, k would be equal to 7, x to the k minus 1 would be equal to equal to 6. Now I've used the mixture of notation here uh, and you'll find this a lot in the control textbooks. Different people do things in different ways. I've written x uh, with a subscript k to indicate the kth time step 
but in the figure I've written it with uh, x brackets 6. So you can either use brackets to indicate the time step or you can use a subscript. They're equivalent. Uh, the advantage, advantage of using the subscript is that you can't confuse it for a functional representation which you do perhaps when you use brackets. So if we said before that s multiplied by x is equivalent to dx dt, the derivative in the time domain, we can approximate a derivative in terms of two measurements, a measurement and the preceding measurement. So perhaps what we could do is substitute wherever we find s of x, we can substitute that with this discrete time approximation to a derivative. Remember always that this expression that I've drawn on the page here is an approximation to the derivative. It only becomes a derivative when the denominator, the time interval, becomes equal to zero. It's the limit as the time interval approaches zero. But if we make it small enough, and we'll talk later about what small enough actually is, then we can replace s of x by this discrete time approximation. So let's see where that takes us. So last time when we left off, we had this expression here, and we had these s's. So what we're going to do is replace the s operator by a discrete time derivative approximation. This is what I've done. So where we had s y, I've now converted that into y k minus y k minus 1 divided by delta t. So it's an approximation of the derivative of y at time step k. Now where I just had capital Y without a derivative, without being multiplied by the Laplace operator s, I've just used time sample k. So I've replaced capital Y by little y k, indicating that it's in the time domain, it's the most current measurement. Similarly for u, s times capital U, I've replaced with a discrete time representation of a derivative of u. Now I can do some simplification and tidying up here, and I end up with an expression like this. And what this shows is that the current value of y is a function of the previous value of y, which is a bit interesting, plus the current value of u and the previous value of u. But what I've written here in this expression is something that I compute. I could write a very simple program to compute uh, this particular function. I need to keep track of the previous value of y, I need to keep track of the previous value of u, but if I know those things, then it's very, very easy to compute yk, the value of this function, at a particular time step. So what is this thing that we've just written? Well, technically it's called a difference equation. We also say that it's recursive. And that means that the output value depends on the previous value of the output and also depends on the previous and current values of the input. So once we know y at the previous time step, we can compute y at the next time step and we repeat this process infinitely. So what I'd like you to do now, a bit of a classroom exercise, is to compute the difference equation for the compensator shown here. GC is equal to S minus 1 over S plus 10. So what I'd like you to do is to basically repeat the process that uh, I went through a few moments ago and write the difference equation for this particular compensator. And if you get a chance, I'd like you to write some MATLAB code in your notebook that would implement it. All right, hopefully you uh, made some progress and had a good discussion around that. So the analog controllers that you've learned about so far in your con control theory careers have been basically look like this. We have a plant represented by a continuous transfer function, G. Uh, we have a sensor. We build what we call a continuous controller uh, based on some compensator. In this particular diagram, it's D of S, Previously, we've called it capital G uh, subscript C, uh, G compensator. It's all been done with analog signals. So the new world that we're moving into is digital control. So we still have our analog plant, G of S. But now what we do is we have our sensor and we take the output of the plant and we sample it. And we'll talk a lot about samplers in coming lectures. We put it through an A to D converter. We take the difference between what the output of the plant is after a analog to digital conversion. 
uh, subtract that from the reference, what, that is what we want the plan output to be. We then pump that through some difference equations which implement the compensator, pump that out through a digital to analog converter and into the plant. So this bottom diagram is the canonical architecture for a digital controller. Every digital controller will fit this model. Now, here's another thing I'd like you to discuss. Uh, here's a very uh, well-known numerical sequence. And what I'd like you to do is spend a few moments and see if you can figure out the pattern here. Okay, so the pattern comes from a gentleman called Fibonacci who lived a very long time ago. And uh, this is one of his original manuscripts. And in the box over on the right hand side, you can see where he actually started to write down this particular sequence, which intrigued him. So the pattern, which I'm hoping you're able to figure out, is that each number in the sequence, uh, oftentimes represented as F of K, so the Kth element of the sequence, uh, F, is equal to the preceding two numbers. So f of k is equal to fk minus 1, the previous value, plus fk minus 2, the value before the previous one. So take, for example, the number 8 here, it's equal to 3 plus 5. 21 is equal to 8 plus 13. 34 is equal to 21 plus 13, and so on. This is another difference equation. And difference equations are actually very, very useful things. So we saw how we could use them to implement a compensator. They have many, many other functions as well. And we're going to talk about some of those. So consider the problem of computing this polynomial. It's a pretty simple polynomial, right? Uh, not very hard at all. But consider that we wanted to compute the value of the polynomial for thousands of values of x. And not only that, we only had an adding machine. Now, you might think that this is an unrealistic problem, but really until the 1940s or 50s, multiplication was very, very hard to do. Adding was relatively straightforward. I mean, even back into the 1600s, uh, you had Pascal's adding machine, which is the brass box shown on the bottom left, and then there were mechanical adding machines and tabulators, which came around in the 1900s. But before that, when people wanted to compute polynomial functions and all they could do was adding, this evaluation was really complicated because we had to take a square, which is a multiplication of a number by itself, then we have to multiply that by 2, and we have to multiply x by 3, and, and so on. So there are some multiplications and there are some squares uh, in, to compute this quite simple polynomial. What are we going to do? So what we can do is consider differences. What I've drawn here is a bit of a table. One column is x. The second column is the value of the polynomial. And I've evaluated it for x equals 0 and for x equals 1. And those values are 2 and 1. Now what I'm going to do is compute a difference between those two values of the polynomial. So between 1 and 2. And so 1 minus 2, I'll take the current value and subtract the previous value. It's The result is minus 1. 1 minus 2 is equal to minus 1. And I'm going to do that again. I'm going to evaluate the polynomial at the next time step. It's 4. I'm going to compute the difference uh, between consecutive polynomial values again. So 4 minus 1 is equal to 3. And then I'm going to take the difference between the differences. So 3 minus minus 1 is equal to 4. This is going somewhere. So hang in there. Bear with me. Let's do this again. I compute yet another value of the polynomial. And this is hard work because I don't have a multiplication machine, so I'm really sweating to get these values of px, uh, the 2, the 1, the 4, and 11. But I compute the difference again, the first difference. 11 minus 4 is equal to 7. 7 minus 3 is equal to 4. And this is kind of interesting because the, this second difference is the same as the second difference I had before. And in fact, for this particular polynomial, the second difference will always be 4. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. So if I know that the second difference is always 4, then I can do a clever thing. What I can do is I can say, OK, I know that the next second difference is going to be 4. I add the 4 to the 7 to figure out the next value of the first difference. So 4 plus 7 is equal to 11. Now, I've got the first difference. I add that to the last value of the polynomial, and I get a value of 22. 
So what I've done is I've computed a new value of the polynomial just using adding. I added 4 to 7, I got 11, I added 11 to 11, and I got 22. Bingo, a new value of the polynomial just using adding. How cool is that? So we do it again, and we can repeat this trick forever. I can evaluate the polynomial. Once I get started, uh, I can evaluate this polynomial for lots of values of x just using adding. Okay, a couple of points to think about. In this particular example, why do we only need to compute the differences to two levels? Right? We only need to take the first difference and then the second difference, which is the difference of the differences. Only to two levels. Why only two? The next point is, why is the second difference always four? Why isn't it three or five? So have a think about those issues, and I'll be back in a moment. All right, discussion answers. A polynomial looks like this. So let's take some derivatives of this polynomial. If I take the first derivative, pretty straightforward stuff, it's 4x minus 3. Let me take the second derivative, it's equal to 4. This is interesting, we've seen this number 4 previously. It was the constant value of the second difference. Yeah, it was always 4. That's why. It's the result, it's the value of the second derivative of the original polynomial. If I take the next derivative, it's equal to naught. And I take another derivative, that's equal to naught. So there's no point going to higher derivatives, just as there's no point going to higher differences. So in this particular case, we can show that we only need to take two differences because the, this polynomial has only got a finite derivative up to the second derivative. Yep. So in fact, if we'd just done this simple piece of calculus, we'd have known in advance that the second derivative was equal to four. We wouldn't have to have computed it numerically as I did. So this is the reason why the second difference is always four and why we only need to take differences up to order two. We don't need to take third differences or fourth differences. So, okay, you're wondering why is all this important? Well, long ago, when multiplication was very hard and all we could do was add, there was a need to tabulate lots of mathematical functions. People wanted to know what was the logarithm of a particular number or the sine of a particular number. And then there were tables that described the motion of celestial bodies, and these were really important for navigation. So people wanted to know how the stars moved in the sky, how the planets moved in the sky. And at that point, everything was tabulated. So there were lots and lots of people involved in computing these great big tables, tables of navigation functions, tables of mathematical functions. And this was really hard work if, you, if multiplication is, very, is a very, very hard thing to do. And it is. But what we know is that a lot of functions can be approximated by series, uh, by polynomials. So let's take logarithms. And in your, probably in your parents' day, or certainly your grandparents' day, when they were at school or university, they would have used tables of logarithms to actually do multiplication. How did you produce the table of logarithms? Well, log of x can be approximated by a series that looks like this. And it's an infinite series, yeah? but uh, you can get quite good value by just the first few terms in this infinite series. So here's a graph of the log function uh, shown here. And here is some uh, overlaid on that are some plots of the polynomial approximation taking into account different numbers of terms. So we can see if we only take t4, only take terms up to order four, uh, we get a pretty good approximation of the log function between 0 and about 0 0.6, 0 0.7. Uh, and as we add more terms, we get increased precision. So we can uh, evaluate the log function over a limited range, in this case, say, between uh, 0 and 0 0.6, 0 0.7, by evaluating a polynomial. And we can compute a polynomial using just addition because we know how to do this difference business. Now the same for sine function. Sine function is really, really important in trigonometry. And it also can be represented by an infinite series, here shown just up to terms of order seven. You can, but you can see a, a clear pattern here. Again, it's an infinite series. And here is a plot that shows the sine function and uh, this polynomial approximation. You can see it does a really good value. 
good job between minus pi and plus pi. So the sine function over a limited numerical range represented by a polynomial. We know how to compute polynomials using the method of differences, so we can compute all the signs using just adding. So that's why differences and difference equations are really important. And certainly for hundreds of, many, many hundreds of years, uh, they were essential to compute mathematical functions. In fact, they were so important that back in 1823, the British government invested a very large amount of money at the time, 1,700 pounds, to this gentleman, gave it to this gentleman, Charles Babbage, to build a difference engine. And what the difference engine did is automatically perform this adding of differences. So it did take, in the example we showed earlier, it would take the second difference of four and add it to the first difference and then add it to the previous value of the polynomial and uh, continually update the value of these polynomial functions and print it out. Uh, and that would then be used to build a table of mathematical functions. 1,700 pounds doesn't sound like very much money, but in today's terms, it's probably somewhere between one and five million British pounds. So at the time, uh, it was a very substantial investment and it just shows how important it was to be able to create these mathematical functions in, in, in a low cost and very accurate way. Remember, if people are doing this function, they're gonna introduce errors. By using a machine, we can get rid of those human errors. So Babbage Difference Engine, they, uh, he, never, he never finished it. Uh, some people recently completed one, and uh, this example is in the British Museum. So I think now it's probably time to talk about where we're going in this unit. So what we're going to do in coming lectures is we're going to have a much more rigorous discussion about converting to difference equations, about how we choose sampling time, and so on. We're also going to introduce something called the Z-transform, uh, which is uh, a cousin of the Laplace transform that you've already met. And uh, the Z-transform is going to be our friend as we move on to develop uh, controllers that we can implement in digital computers. We're going to talk a bit about numerical issues. We're going to talk about how long it takes to do computation. How long does it take to multiply and add in a, in a typical computer? We're going to look at the dynamic range of numbers, issues to do with saturation and quantization. These are all terms that we'll cover in uh, incoming lectures. Now, in the previous lectures in this unit, you've been introduced to state space systems. And we're going to visit this again, but this time in terms of what we call the sampled version of state space systems, the discrete time version that you would implement in a computer. We're going to look at stability. Uh, we're going to look at the root locus diagram again. We're going to look at pole placement uh, control again, but now in terms of the Z transform rather than in terms of the S transform or the Laplace transform. We're going to look at a new type of control called deadbeat control, which you can only do uh, in digital control. You can't do it in analog controller. We're going to visit optimal control again, but again, the digital version of that. We're also going to look at systems with time delay, which are really important in the real world. Now, to try and make all of these concepts tangible, we need to apply them to a real system. And the system that we've chosen to apply this to is a Segway-like machine. So these are Segways. Uh, quite a, uh, a popular, uh, though somewhat expensive, personal transporter. Now, we're not going to use real segways, uh, but if you're interested in segways, uh, there's a really interesting book written by a journalist who was embedded in the segway team while it was working, uh, a guy called Steve Kemper. And the segway team was led by the gentleman on the right, uh, Dean Kamen, uh, a very, very prolific American inventor. And uh, he led the development of the segway Somewhere along, along the journey, uh, Kemper and uh, Cayman fell out with one another. And so there's an interesting chapter in the book about, about that. But anyway, there's quite a readable novel about the history of the development of the Segway. So as I said, we're not going to use real Segways. Uh, we're going to do it in Lego. So in this project, in this unit, we're going to give you a Lego NXT kit. And that comprises the brick, which is the thing shown in the top left, uh, it's a little embedded controller. It's got an LCD screen. It's got a few simple buttons. And you're going to develop code on a PC, load it into the brick where it will do stuff. Now, you can connect many things to the brick. 
And the important thing you're going to connect to the brick is a motor, and that's what's shown in the bottom right. And you can also connect sensors to this, and the sensor you're going to use is a gyro sensor, which is going to give you the angle of the Segway with respect to vertical. So you're going to have two motors uh, to control the wheels and a gyro to determine the inclination of the Segway with respect to vertical. And that's the toolkit that you're going to use. Now you'll be programming the brick in the C programming language, or a very close uh, cousin of the C programming language, a thing called Robot C. And uh, so the first chute and uh, the first prac uh, are going to going to get you familiar with the robot C language because that's what you're going to need to use for the rest of the unit. So resources for this unit, uh, these are some slides that I borrowed from Dave that he showed in the very first lecture. Uh, digital control is a difficult one because really to my mind the best book is the one by uh, Franklin and Powell and Workman, the third edition of Digital Control of Dynamic Systems. It's an old book and it's not, you can't buy it anymore. Uh, the library has a very small number of copies. Uh, we have ordered some in, uh, there'll be reprints, but uh, they're probably not gonna get here uh, until perhaps later in the unit, and that's unfortunate. Uh, if you can get your hands on a copy of it, that's great. I don't think it's gonna be essential uh, to your understanding of the unit. We're gonna go fairly slowly uh, through, the, through the material, in the coming lectures and reinforce that in the tutorials and reinforce that in the prax. So digital control of dynamic systems, nice to have, but not essential. I've listed a few other books here that uh, touch on topics around this. Uh, again, if you get your hands on them, have a look at them, read them, see if you like them before you would uh, commit to, to buying them. You are going to need to be familiar with MATLAB and Simulink and also become familiar with Robot C. Assessment. Again, this is a, a slide that I borrowed from Dave uh, from the very first lecture. What we're doing in this second part is discrete time control, which is uh, worth 30% of your final assessment. Uh, so it's effectively half of the final exam. Optimal control, you've done some of that in the analog domain, you'll do some of that in the digital domain. And the other topic is prac number two. It's 20% of your total assessment. Basically, you're designing a Segway robot using Lego and Simulink. Uh, you're going to actually implement it and there'll be a prac demonstration. So we'll assess the performance of your little Segway robot. And we'll give you a task like, you know, first of all, I guess clearly you've got to be able to balance uh, you get some points for balancing, you may get some points for moving from uh, one point to another, uh, maybe some points if you can you know, move forward and do a turn or something like that. More details as we progress. And there's also a prac report. So we don't just want to see a working Lego Segway widget, we also want to understand what was your thought process, how did you design the controller. So we're looking for a prac report there as well. And that's the end of the first lecture. Uh, I hope that was of some value. You understand why it is we're talking about digital control. Uh, we're gonna move now on to the tutorial and then on to the prac. Thanks very much.